allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please note that uh, all council members are present except for Councilman Kerr and Councilman Fairbanks. Open Meetings Act is posted on the wall. We'll move on to the consent agenda. All items under the consent agenda are considered to be routine by the City Council and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a council member so requests. Item A, approve agenda as submitted. Item B, receive in place on file all notices pertaining to this meeting. Item C, receive and place on file all materials having any bearing on this meeting. Item D, approval of minutes of regular meeting <clears throat> on October 16, 2023 is on file with the city clerk's office. Approval of treasurer's report of claims in the amount of $758,307.59. Item F, approval of Boswell report of claims in the amount of $26,762.42. Item G, approval of pay request number three in the amount of $76,827.45 to Lamo Plumbing for the Gage County Industrial Park Sanitary Sewer Bypass Project Phase 3, 2023 as recommended by the Board of Public Works. Item H, approval of the change order number one, increase in the amount of $6,730 and final pay request in the amount of $38,159.22 to Lotman Excavating for the Standing Bear Trail Parking Lot Storm Sewer Detention Facility 2023 project. Item I, approval of pay request number one in the amount of $119,522.28 to Shone's <coughs> Roofing for the Beatrice Municipal Airport Roof Bids Project. Item J, approval of Beatrice Plus application from the Friends of the Falls in the amount of $10,000 to construct a flagstone area near the Chautauqua Park waterfall as recommended by the Beatrice Plus Advisory Board. Uh, referred claim of Stephen Wright under the Nebraskan Political Subdivision Tort Claim Act to the City Attorney and the City Insurance Carrier for Review and Disposition. Item L, resolution number 7160, granting permission to the Beatrice Area Chamber of Commerce and Gage County Tourism and their designees to sell or offer for sale or peddle goods, wares, and merchandise upon the city property located in Charles Park, the Carnegie Building, the public parking lot just south of the Carnegie Building, and the 5th Street between High Street and the East-West Alley between Ella Street and High Street as part of their Holiday Lighted Parade event on December 2nd, 2023. Item M, resolution number 7161, executing a grant agreement with the Nebraska Emergency Management Agency for the purpose of conducting a stormwater drainage study of the Belvedere area of the city of Beatrice. Resolution and N, resolution number 7162, executing the grant agreement with the Nebraska Emergency Management Agency for the purpose of conducting a stormwater drainage study for tributary 44. Item O, resolution number 7163, amending the city's Federal Family and Medical Leave Act policy. Item P, resolution number 7164, entering into the second amendment to the parking lot lease and the second amendment to the test area lease between the city and Exmark Manufacturing Company Incorporated. Item Q, resolution number 7165, executing the agreement with advanced Rescue Education Solutions, LLC, to provide clinical education services for students attending educational programs for paramedic, EMT, and AEMT services. Any councilman would like anything pulled off? M. M. Okay. Anybody else? Mr. McLean. I move the items listed on the consent agenda with the exception of item M be approved, accepted, and ratified as presented. Second. Your vote, please. That passes 6-0. Okay. I move the light item M listed on the consent agenda be approved, accepted, and ratified as presented. Second. Just a couple of quick questions, Mayor. The, uh, so if I understand this right. This is a $3,000 grant 
and they, I'm not sure I understand where the 27,000 comes into this, T. Is that the max they're willing to do? The 3,000 is our part, and they're willing to pay up to 27,000 for the study? So this is a grant we applied for in December of 21. Right. We estimate at that time that the study would cost $30,000. FEMA will pick up 90% of it or $27,000 of the proposed cost. We would be responsible for the additional $3,000 of the study. Okay, I'm, I'm with you now. The, um, can we get that done in that time frame? That's um, in there? That would be the tough part. Uh, I, the grant says we have to have it done in a year. They've sat on it now for about three months before they told us that we were awarded the grant. Yeah, At the end of the day, the um, FEMA has the opportunity to extend the grant uh, if we need to, and they've told us that, that if it comes to that to point. Do. Say that again? Is that pretty easy to do? Because this is May. It's already, you know. No, it's not. But That's what I was thinking. Those are the options we're given, yeah. and so yeah. we will work to either make the deadline or work with them to try to get an extension. Once, once we do that, and then I'll stop. Once we do that study and... The people, whether they're here up north or the, whether they're in Belvedere, um, do we have any utility easements going down the gut of that uh, drainage area that we're talking about? No, that's the difficult part. The, the drainage area in Belvedere, we're talking third to fourth street, Franklin down the sharp list up in that area. Yeah. We do not have utility easements. We do not have drainage easements, those types of things in that location. Yeah, we, um, I lived there right there for about seven or eight years. We have really big trees going up and down that thing. That's gonna be a tough deal to do. But at least we're doing it because people want it done. Yeah, I appreciate we'll start with the study. We'll appreciate see what... both you guys doing that. Okay, anybody else? Your vote, please. And that passes 6-0. Uh, we'll move on to tonight, to a public hearing. Uh, tonight we have a public hearing for the purpose of considering the application of Sony Co. LLC doing business as U Stop Convenience Shop, 2766 Scott Street, Beatrice, Nebraska, for a Class D liquor license. And I'll be covering both John and Chet's. Okay. So swear me in. All right. So I'll swear in. You're, you'll be doing both. Yes. Okay. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. Yes. Thank you. All right, so we had, uh, with any liquor license, we do a couple of different investigations. One was done by the police department by Investigator Byrne. He looks into the background of Todd and Sonny Heido, and he turned up nothing that would prohibit the issuance of a Class D liquor license uh, to them. The other investigation we do is on the playing and zoning uh, side of things. And Chet McGrewy looked into the property out there. Uh, if everybody's familiar with the location of this, this is out at where a, Scott Street meets Highway 136. And that area is currently zoned general commercial. Uh, there's general commercial around it uh, and some R4. Uh, Chet did not see anything that would prohibit the uh, issuance of a liquor license for that location. Discussion, gentlemen. From the public. Seeing none, your vote, please. We need a motion to close the hearing. Oh, sorry. I move that we close the public hearing at 7.08 p.m. Second. Your vote, please. And that passes 6 0. I move the application for Sony Company LLC doing business as U Stop Convenience Shop, 2766 Scott Street, Beatrice, Nebraska, for a Class D liquor license be recommended to the Nebraska Liquor Control Commission for approval. Second. Any more discussion needed? Seeing none, your vote, please. That passes 6-0. Okay, we'll move on to resolutions. Resolution number 7166, executing the sponsorship agreement with Jones Group Insurance for Hannibal Park. I move the resolution number 7166 be passed and adopted. Second. So again, working with Sportsman Solutions, uh, looking for sponsors out at Hannibal Park, which is powered by Pinnacle Bank. Uh, the first one we have for you tonight is uh, with Jones Group. Uh, they're providing $38,500 for 10 years of advertising out there. They'll get four scoreboards and three outfield signs, and they will make all of their payment in one lump sum, which I believe they've already paid. Excellent. Any discussion? All right. Your vote, please. And that passes 6-0. Okay, resolution number 7167, executing a sponsorship agreement with members' own credit union for Hannibal Park. I move that resolution number 7167 be passed and adopted. Second. 
Again, uh, same thing, but this one's with uh, members' own. Uh, they are donating $50,000 to go to the naming rights of field number three out of the facility. Again, a 10-year agreement, and they are to pay their fee within the next 30 days. Any more discussion? This has turned out to be a really good process for um, the city as we can try to continue to work on Hannibal Park. Okay. Gentlemen, your vote, please. That passes five with one abstention. Resolution number 7168, executing the sponsorship agreement with Pinpoint Communications Incorporated for Hannibal Park. I move the resolution number 7168 be passed and adopted. Second. Uh, again, same thing. Uh, this one is for Pinpoint. Uh, as everybody's well with Pinpoint coming in with the fiber here in town, uh, they're willing to donate $6,000. They'll get two outfield signs. That's a six-year agreement, and they'll be making their payment in the month of November. Say six or 60? $6,000. Any other discussion? If not, your vote, please. And that passes 6-0. <clears throat> okay. Resolution number 7169, executing an agreement between the city and the Beatrice Humane Society Incorporated regarding the care, handling, and disposition of animals impounded by the city of Beatrice. I move that resolution number 7169 be passed and adopted. Second. So what we have before you tonight is a, another funding agreement with the Humane Society. It's kind of got, been an ongoing agreement with the Humane Society. This one is almost identical to the last one. It's another three-year term. It provides for payments of $20,000 per year, plus an additional $1,000 per month to assist with some of the utilities that they have out there. Uh, outside of that, again, it's pretty much identical to what we currently have uh, with the Humane Society. Any discussion from the public? If not, gentlemen, your vote, please. That passes 6-0. Resolution number 7170, executing the agreement between the city and the Beatrice Humane Society Incorporated to partner together to address the community cat issue within the city of Beatrice. I move that resolution number 7170 be passed and adopted. Second. So we've talked about for years, uh, Try to find a, a way to handle the community cats or feral cats in our community. Uh, the Humane Society has approached us with a proposal. Uh, the proposal before you tonight is a seven-year agreement. Uh, they have started up a, a low-cost spay and neuter clinic in which they would use to help uh, facilitate this program. Uh, the city then would make, as part of this agreement, we'd pay $40 per cat or up to $6,000 per year as part of this agreement against a seven-year agreement. I'm happy to have anybody from the Humane Society come up and talk about the actual program itself, but it's a trap, neuter, vaccinate, release program. Uh, so, so again, you, you trap the animal, you come and you fix it, you then vaccinate it to make sure it's not have disease, and then you release it back into the, the area where it was originally trapped. But I will let somebody who knows this matter far more than I do come up and talk. Hello, Carly Fittis, Executive Director of the Beatrice Humane Society, address is 1712 Pleasant View here in Beatrice. Um, so thank you for having us here today. Um, this is something that I think um, very much impacts both the people and the animals here in our community. Um, we just talked about the uh, contract that we have with the city regarding our strays, and uh, those stray numbers have been really constant for about the last 10 years. For all of the adoptions that we do, for all of the spayed and, animals that we, spayed and neutered animals that we put back into this community, there's been no real change in the number of animals coming into our shelter. In fact, at times those numbers have gone up and that's not the right direction for us to be heading. The problem is, is when we take them in at the shelter as strays, um, they come in unspayed and unneutered, we spay and neuter them and we put them out into indoor homes. But that leaves the problem kind of just sitting out there. It's the unspayed and unneutered ones that are having those kittens in the first place that end up in my shelter as strays. And so this is um, our real world um, efforts to be able to actually get to the base of the problem by um, providing uh, those spay and neuter services to those outdoor unfriendly cats that we can't catch, that wouldn't make good house cats, that nobody wants in their house, and be able to actually um, stop the problem at the source. Um, 
So with our new low-cost spay-neuter clinic, we have made this as cost-effective of a program as you will find anywhere. Um, up at Capital Humane Society for a very similar pro uh, program, it's $50 for a cat. Here at our shelter, we're, even, we're, we're, we're taking that even a step lower. Um, we've looked at our costs. It's the lowest that we can do and keep the doors open and the lights on. Um, but what that does is that gets every animal that comes through our door spayed and neutered, vaccinated for both rabies and distemper, microchipped, and ear-tipped. So um, all together, what they get is they go back out into our community. They are spayed and neutered and can't procreate. They are vaccinated against one of the, the only deadly communicable disease that is 100% fatal to humans when exposed. Um, they're protected against that. They're also protected against some of those diseases that can um, really, really impact our shelter. Um, last November, we had a situation where panleukopenia, um, big word, doesn't matter. Anyhow, it's a disease that spread by cats, made it into our shelter, and we actually had to shut down intake for about three weeks. Um, we lost 21 cats in that process um, just because when they become ill, there's very little that can be done treatment-wise. We were very limited in how we could isolate them, and that was a very hard situation for us. And the most impacted are those stray animals. So by putting more vaccinated animals back out into the community, it's less likely that those diseases are going to make it into our shelter. Just sprinkling those, spaded, those vaccinated ones out there just kind of acts as a buffer to keep those diseases at bay. The microchip piece is a really big public health um, initiative for us. Um, those microchips cost us six bus bucks a piece. It would be real easy to say, actually closer to seven bucks a piece now. Um, thank you, inflation. Um, that would be a really easy thing to say, oh, I can save $7 on every single one of these TNR cats. But what that microchip does is that tracks that specific cat and that specific cat's medical record. So if down the road, um, a police officer or an animal control officer comes to me and says, hey, Car hey Carly, this cat bit a lady on 7th Street. Um, can you check to see if it's one of the microchipped ones. If it's got an ear tip, that makes it pretty likely. I think we're the only ones doing the ear tips here in Beatrice right now. And we, when we scan that microchip, that tells us that cat's specific information, including all of the medical records. So we'll have um, when that cat was vaccinated, how that cat was vaccinated, who spayed that animal. Um, all of that information will be at our ready. And so we'll be able to provide better information for our community. And then also just for ourselves. So if we have a cat that comes in as a stray um, and we, we know where it was at in town, we know, um, you know, if it's made it all the way across town, clearly whoever brought it in wasn't feeding them appropriately or there's other things going on that we need to be addressing. So it really just allows us to be able to better, more humanely handle those cats that don't make good candidates for indoor cats. Um, we did make this proposal in a way that is hopefully going to discourage the general public from abusing it. Um, one of the concerns that we have is, is that um, some owner is going to be you know, tight for cash this month and uh, take their fluffy Persian cat and shove it in a trap and bring it in and say, oh, the city's paying for this one. Now, that's not what we're here for. That's not what our goal is. And so we have added a um, section here that... Um, we will actually evaluate all of the cats that come through this program um, for friendliness. If they are deemed friendly, the person that brings them in has two choices. They can still pay the $40 and they can get their cat uh, spayed and neutered through this program and they can take their cat back home or they leave it with us and there's no charge to you and no charge to them and that cat will get adopted into an indoor home. So by doing that, we're actually hitting this population in two different ways. We're keeping those friendlies, we're getting those friendlies back out of the, out, off of the streets and into our shelter, and those unfriendly ones, which are not candidates for indoor placement, stay back out there and, again, keep procreating at a minimum. Um, so by doing this, um, we expect to see um, pretty profound changes, hopefully, in the next five years. And um, hopefully, when we're talking about this in seven years, we're sitting here saying, oh, yeah, we, we don't really need your money anymore, Beatrice. We got this all squared away. Um, we know that with that continued um, effort every single year that we can really build on that and create a, a community of cats that are spayed and neutered and vaccinated <clears throat> and well taken care of and not causing problems. Um, so I did um, speak to a lot of business people in the process of kind of building this. Um, one of them that I spoke to that I would like to share a couple of her thoughts um, would be uh, Deanne Caspers with uh, Caspers Construction. Um, they own a business here in town. I, I think you guys probably all are familiar with it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Um, uh, Deanne actually in one of the meetings with Tobias when we were talking about this, she's like, oh, thank goodness we're actually starting to do something about this because they have a little old lady near their business that feeds cats. And this is a very common thing. Um, we're humans. We're compassionate. Watching an animal starve to death is not something any of us are particularly keen to do. Um, we're we're going to help out where we can help out. Unfortunately, with cats, by even just feeding them, we're actually allowing them the ability to, to procreate more, to have more babies. A well-fed cat will have a litter of six to ten babies. An unfed cat will have one to two. So as these people feed these animals out of compassion, they're really just kind of 
creating more of a burden on the rest of us. This lady is, I assume, a very nice lady. Um, she is older. She lives well under the poverty line here in Beatrice. Um, she doesn't have any pennies to rub together, and I guarantee you if I tell her it's $40 a cat to TNR them, she's not going to be able to, to assist in any way, shape, or form. Um, she probably uses her last dollar on that cat food that she's providing for them. Um, so in these situations, we have a few choices, right? We can, we can get mad at the little old lady. We can create laws that will prevent her from feeding them. Um, she will either hide her feeding them better, or maybe she'll stop feeding them. But really, that doesn't solve the business's problem. The business's problem is, is that there are cats that are, that are urinating and defecating where they don't want them. There are cats crawling where they don't want them. There are cats being hit by a car in front of their business, and their customers are having to drive past that. And these things aren't visually appealing for a business. So maybe we put it on the business. Maybe the business is the one that should be responsible for spaying and neutering these and, and, and controlling the population. And really, that, 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 that can't work either. Like, that's, that's, that's not a busy business-friendly practice. Um, so with a TNR program in place, what we'd be able to do is we'd be able to go into that situation. Again, any of the friendly cats we'll be able to take into our shelter and remove from the population to start with. Usually ends up being about a third of the cats are friendly enough that they can come into our shelter or young enough that they can come into our shelter and we can socialize them and get them adopted out. And then for the other two thirds, we can get them spayed and neutered, vaccinated, microchipped, and returned to that location, which means that they're less likely to spray and cause that odor that none of us enjoy. Um, they're less likely to wander and get hit by a car. They're more likely to stay close to where that feeder is at. And honestly, almost instantaneously after being spayed and neutered, their um, nutritional needs are cut in half. So that little old lady may even be able to uh, save on some of that food that she's been providing them. Um, so I really do think that this TNR program is one of the best ways that we can be known as a business compassionate, animal compassionate community that is really striving to become the best that we can be for, for all people here. I think that's about all I've got. I do have, if anybody is interested, um, we did just do a very similar kind of um, TNR program to what Casper's Construction would need. Um, up in Hickman, um, we worked with uh, six different rescues that came together to fund this program. Um, and we um, spayed and neutered 30 cats that were um, affecting an auto dealership up there. He, he said he had um, kittens being born in his car engines and cats marking on the car tires before, as, as the owners were dropping off their vehicles and that it was affecting his, his auto business. And um, so we went in and we, we TNR that. Um, we, again, took about a third of them out and we were able to adopt out about a third of those animals. Um, not all of those came here to us because Hickman is not in Gage County, um, but we worked with the other rescues to be able to make sure that they had spayed and neutered animals that they were taking. Um, we were able to get um, the rest of them spayed and neutered, vaccinated, microchipped, ear tipped, and released back out there. And that um, auto dealership has already said that, you know, he's already seen an improvement. There aren't any kittens running around. Those were the ones that were getting hit by a car. Um, you know, every few days, those were the ones that his employees were having to peel off the sidewalk or off the street. And that's just not the appearance that he wants for his business. And he's already said that those things have improved. So I do have a letter. Um, they wanted to be here, but life. Um, I do have a letter from one of the residents in Hickman that was involved with that, as well as one of the rescue people. If anybody's interested in those, I can share them. But if you have any other questions, I also would be willing to answer those. In other towns that this has been used? Yes. Have they seen a large success rate? Yes. It is the only truly successful option for, for managing cat populations. Um, to be completely honest, um, Hawaii and Australia both have feral cat problems. They have, for the last 20 years, been trying to use euthanasia as the sole method of controlling their cat populations, and neither one of them have made any progress in 20 years. So um, there are communities in Washington, in Denver, in Fort Collins, in um, Hickman <laughs> um, that have done the trap, neuter, and release and seen very, very, very strong benefits. Um, I was actually just talking to the executive director up at Capital Humane Society. Comparatively, they have a very small program for the size of their city. Um, I would say they actually need to do better. But um, even with the two to 300 animals that they're doing through their TNR program each year, they've actually seen almost a thousand animal difference in their number of intakes over the course of that same period of time that they've been doing those TNRs. So those TNRs really are impacting their intakes. And um, that's kind of our goal here is to make a, a real concerted effort to change the underlying population that's causing ours. The, the other quick question is, how do you catch the ones that don't want to be caught? 
Yeah, um, so we have traps for that. <laughs> um, uh, so we've actually been working with um, one of the groups up in Lincoln that has been trapping for um, Capital Humane Society. It's called Joining Forces Saving Lives. Um, there are some crazy cat people out there that really all they do is go out and trap cats, and they've been teaching us all of the tricks of the trade. Um, out at the shelter, we have purchased um, several box traps, which are the ones that you guys would recognize. They, they're the ones we use for raccoons here in Nebraska. Um, those are the most ideal ones to use in most of these situations. We've We've also purchased a large drop trap with which is more along the lines of anybody remembers Tom and Jerry and the 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 mouse goes in and Jerry pulls the string and then the box falls on yeah that it's that concept um, believe it or not it actually works very effectively for cats and we've purchased one of those as well um, that'll be fantastic for situations where we have large volumes of cats that all go to the same feeding locations we can uh, catch four or five six cats in one drop versus those raccoon traps where we can only catch one at a time so depending on the situation, we have the tools in place in, in our shelter. Um, those will be available for rent to our community. Um, the box trap, maybe not so much because it does require a little bit of expertise, but we have volunteers that will be training to be able to go out and help out in these situations. So where there's um, a problem, we can actually direct volunteers to go in and, and actually assist with that trapping to be able to get them to our clinic. Yeah, I have sure. several, several questions. Uh, is it do you use volunteers to trap the cats? Or are you going to have increased labor costs? Um, our goal is going to be to use volunteers, but when it comes down to it, our staff are going to be training them. Our staff are going to be making sure they're in the right places at the right time. Um, so there's probably going to be slight um, increase in labor costs, but right now um, that's going to be changed by the fact that we're going to have less coming in. Uh, do you have any idea what kind of cat populations I've heard that we have several colonies? Do you have any idea how many? Um, so my best estimate, and this is, this is um, you know, just kind of looking at the number that come in each year as kittens and kind of estimating the adults that would be producing those. Um, so we have, um, from the city limits of Beatrice, about 250 cats come in every single year. Um, and those are cats and kittens, and those are primarily kittens. And so that cat population that's producing those is what we're kind of looking at. And then also remembering that we're taking 250 out every single year, and by the next year there's 250 more to take out. So there's a pretty decent population out there to be able to produce 250. So our low estimate, and this is probably low, would be 750 to 1,000. Um, I will tell you that when we go out to a situation like Hickman, we guessed 12. We thought, oh, well, we got about 12 cats and kittens. Um, 35 is where we ended it, and there are still two more that we need to get. And so um, th this, is, this is something that it, it's probably a much bigger problem than we recognize. Um, we've had a few people that have already started using the $40 TNRs for the cats that they feed. Um, if they're able to do that, we've already been doing that for the last several months. And there was one that she's like, yeah, I've got like four or five that I feed, and I think she's on... 12? 12. Twelve. Um, so, <laughs> um, and I think she's probably got a couple more that she's still trying for. So the, the fact is, is that they're out there. We don't always know that they're out there, but if we can get them spayed and neutered, they're going to stop causing us all of the problems that we're seeing. So you, you got several people that's feeding cats and feeding the feral cats? Um, we don't, but I do know that they're out there, and I am confident that when we have a program in place that they, that they need assistance from, they will come forward. I, I, I know they're out there. Okay, uh, how, I know what the city gives it. What's the county contribute to this? So we is there regular? Um, so we haven't taken this to the county yet. And the reason is, is because this is really a city problem. I will say that there are villages in Gage County that need this even more than we do. I will tell you, Wymore is a big, big ticket on that one. Um, I don't think you can drive through Wymore without seeing a cat. I actually don't know if I've ever been able to. Um, so what I'm actually hoping to do is, um, through this model that we're creating with Beatrice, be able to actually go to these other communities um, and focus on the community level. Um, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to get the Gage County Board of Supervisors behind something that is so city-focused. Um, I'd like to say that I'll get there, but we'll see how it goes. I think the cities and their individual um, community kind of programs are going to be what's going to best suit this kind of project. Um, and we have already um, had interest expressed by a multitude of city employees and, 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 and um, uh, people down in Wymore. So I think Wymore will probably be pretty close to right behind you guys in, in, in setting up a program like this. Um, city of Virginia has also reached out. Um, the city of um, Cortland has also reached out. 
I think there's a couple more. Um, you know, they're, they're, uh, they're mostly just reaching out for information at this point. But as we have a model that they can kind of build off of that really helps them know how to do this and what we're able to offer and how we're able to offer it, it I'm confident that most of these communities need it and we're going to be able to do a lot more. What's the county contribute just regularly to the Humane Society? Uh, 18,000 a year is what they do for this stray contract. Less than we are. Yeah. Okay. If you want to get them to up that, I'd love that too. I want you to get them to up it. <laughs> and I know you'll work hard on that. Yeah. <laughs> are you going to approach them about this program? Um, honestly, I, again, I, I really don't know if, if the county board is going to be super, super, um, because th there are feral cats in the county. Let's, let's be honest here. Um, there are barn cats in every single barn in this state. Um, but when it comes down to it, um, they don't put out food like we do here in the city. They don't have a multitude of people. Um, cats have a radius of about a mile that they'll find food in out in the country. That may just be you and one neighbor. And if that cat can't find food between you and that one neighbor, they wander off and they get hit by a car down the road. Um, so what happens in the, in, in the county is, is that their population is controlled just by the fact that those cats are having to move. We are seeing a pretty big movement of um, rural property owners coming in and using our TNR services. So we've had quite a few of those. Um, and I do think that we'll be able to make some some traction in the in, in the communities with the with the city and the village councils um, being able to get things going down there. But um, I don't know if the I don't know if the county board's going to be on board with things like that. But as you said, we can cancel this one. if we if we wouldn't think it's working as a body, we can cancel this contract. Correct. The contract has an out provision that provides for 30 days of notice of either party. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions from the council? From the public. Seeing none, gentlemen. <laughs> That's okay. Your vote, please. And that passes 6 0. Nice job. Thank you. Make it work. Okay. And in relation to this, we have an ordinance here, Ordinance Amending 5-1 of the Beatrice City Code regarding definitions of animal and fowl ordinances. Um, the first thing we'll vote on is to take action tonight we'll, to see if we're going to suspend the rules and read this ordinance by number three times tonight. A motion to suspend the rules is not debatable. I move that said an ordinance be given number 23-30, the title, title thereof be approved, the rules be suspended, and said an ordinance be read by number only three times tonight. Second. Gentlemen, your vote, please. That passes 6-0. Ordinance number 23-30 by number the first time, 20 by 20-30 20 by number the second time, and 20-30 by number the third and final time. I move that the ordinance number 23-30 be passed and approved. Second. Any more discussion needed? So the ordinance today uh, is that if you basically feed or harbor a cat for three consecutive days, uh, you're deemed to be the owner of it. So what we put in here was an exception that except if you're participating in the TNR program that is being administered by the Beatrice Humane Society within the corporate limits of the city of Beatrice, that then does not apply to you. So hopefully we can get people to partake in this program. Any discussion? Your vote, please. And that passes 6-0. Okay, we move on to ordinance to convey real estate owned by the city to Radiant Tech LLC. Once again, uh, since this is an ordinance, the first vote will be to see we suspend the rules and be read by the number. A motion to suspend the rules is not debatable. I move that said an ordinance be given number 23-31. The title thereof be approved. The rules be suspended. And the said ordinance be read to my number only three times tonight. Second. Gentlemen, your vote, please. That passes 6-0. Ordinance number 23-31 by number the first time. 23-31 by number the second time. And 23-31 by number the third and final time. I move that ordinance number 23-31 be passed and approved. Second. Last week we brought before you an option for this piece of ground uh, with Radiant Tech. Uh, this is out in the industrial park. This would be on the southeast corner of Industrial Row and Centennial Drive. Um, we've been in contact with Radiant uh, 
tech since then, and they, were, uh, they want to exercise their option. And so they've given us written notice that that's what they want to do. So we brought back for you tonight the actual ordinance to do that. And again, it's two and a half acres, and the price is $37,500. Discussion? From the public? Gentlemen, your vote. 6 0, it passes. Okay, item C ordinance to convey real estate owned by the city to Hoppy and Son LLC. Once again, it's an ordinance. Uh, we're going to vote first vote to see if we spend the rules and read it by the number. A motion to suspend the rules is not debatable. I move that said ordinance be given number 23 32. The title thereof be approved. The rules be suspended. And the said ordinance be read by number only three times tonight. Second. Your vote, please. Passes 6 0. Okay. Ordinance number 2332. By number only the first time. 2332. By number the second time. 23 32. By number the third and final time. I move that ordinance number 23 32 be passed and approved. Second. All right, so we have a couple of different items going on here. You'll see the ordinance here to convey real estate, then you see a resolution. Uh, for a real estate contract, and then you'll see a resolution for an MOU, uh, all those with Hoppy and Sons or Hoppy Development. So again, this is the Kensington. Uh, if everybody remembers, we've got an agreement worked out with uh, Main Street, who currently today owns that building. Uh, we thought we had the grant figured out, so we but we have postponed closing with uh, Main Street until some probably next June, July or so, somewhere in that time period. Uh, the city went ahead and issued an RFQ looking for developers for the property. Uh, when going through that proposal, the city has selected Hoppy and Sons as the developer for this particular project. And so in the MOU, uh, what you have is basically that the city selecting uh, Hoppy Development and then stating that we'll work together to kind of cover the gap financing that's out there. Uh, they understand that they've got some money, uh, but the project is going to be quite expensive. We thought the grant was going to help us cover a large portion of that. It may or may not here in the future. We're still walking through that one. Uh, but the MOU says we're going to work together. And then the real estate contract that you have, and it's hard to talk about one without talking about the others, uh, is just that. It's a real estate contract between the city and, and Hoppy. Uh, it says that the contract price is $1. So basically, we're going to give them the property, but it's contingent upon a couple of things. One, they got to find gap financing. And so they're going to look at housing trust funds. They're going to look for TIF, rural workforce housing, those types of things that are out there. Uh, and it also says that the agreement is good for one year, but Hoppy has to submit for historic tax credits by July 1st of next year, and they have to secure an allotment by, by uh, November 6th of next year. So when talking to Hoppy, it's gonna take them a while to get all the paperwork done to turn in to get their historic tax credit application ready. They think they're gonna probably end up spending about three to $400,000 on that application because they have to do architectural drawings and get attorneys and accountants involved. So they think it's gonna be quite expensive on their part. We wanted something to make sure that they were gonna go through with this and they weren't simply just gonna sit on the project. And so that's why you see the dates in there. Uh, Hoppy has the ability to kind of extend the agreement if they're waiting for answers back from the state, right? We've all been there. Uh, we have the ability to terminate the agreement if they're not moving forward with the project. Uh, but this is kind of the first step. The next one is continue to go out and look for gap, gap financing uh, to put this project together. Discussion. Start the and it's just important that the public knows that we're, we're doing everything we can do right now. We just need money. Right. We're doing everything else that needed to be done. So appreciate everybody's work on that. And I think this company has been very interested in the building since the start of it. They have looked at it several times. And I think it'd be great for the downtown redevelopment that this moves forward and get it across the finish line. I think it'd be great. Anybody from the public? Seeing none, your vote, please. That passes 6 0. Now we'll move on to resolution F, resolution number 7171, executing a contract for sale to real of real estate and all necessary documents to Hoppy and Son LLC. I move the resolution number 7171 be passed and adopted. Second. So this is just the real estate contract that holds the terms that we just discussed. Any more discussion needed? If not, your vote, please. Passes 6-0.
And uh, resolution G, resolution number 7172, executing the memorandum of understanding between the city and Hoppy and Son LLC regarding the redevelopment of Paddock, Paddock, Paddock Kensington, located at 105 North 6th Street. I move the resolution number 7172 be passed and adopted. Second. Any further discussion needed? If not, your vote, please. That passes 6 0. Okay, six, public forum. The first public forum is for the presentation of an item by the general public to the city council for a consideration at a later date. No discussion or action will be taken by the council at this time. Anyone here for the public forum? Name and address first, right? Yep. Okay, Mitch Minky, 210 Granville Avenue. I hope this is the right time to bring this up. I was wondering if the city would consider uh, paving uh, 26th Street between Lincoln and Hoyt or Sunridge Court. With the new developments out there, um, that road is getting used a lot. At the junction of uh, 26th Street and Lincoln, um, about every probably six weeks to two months, there's holes developing where the gravel meets the pavement. And so the city's got to go there every once in a while to throw more rock or whatever in there. And whatever it is on that street, the few times a year that it's graded, about a week and a half, two weeks later, and I'm not exaggerating, 75% of that road is nothing but a washboard. And so, you know, you're tearing up vehicles, you know, all that kind of stuff. With the development that's going out there, I just was going to bring it to the city thinking that maybe they could pave that 26th Street between Lincoln and Hoyt, well, Sunridge Court or whatever it is over there. So that's all I had. Okay, thank you. Thanks, you bet. Anyone else? If not, we'll move on to discussion and reports. We have one tonight, Engage Quarterly Report. Rachel? I understand you've been busy today. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening, Councilman, Mr. Mayor. Um, so before you, you have um, the Engage Quarterly Report, so it would be quarter one of the 23-24 fiscal year for Engage. Um, just a few things that I'm going to highlight and one thing that I'll point out at the back of your packet that's also kind of dictating some of the work that we're doing in a couple of our strategies. Um, on the first page on the inside, a couple of our highlights that we've um, been working on in our activities with the Communities for Kids Initiative, or C4K, as, as we promote it, the preschool development grant, which is one of three that we're operating, is getting ready to wrap up towards the end of December. So that's the grant that's funding our contract employee. Um, she has been able to get 63% of child care providers participating actively in that grant, which is great. Um, there's just a handful that haven't participated and we're actively doing things to engage the, I think it's like eight providers in the county that are not participating in that grant or have yet to participate. So things are going very well in that respect. We also recently hosted Manufacturing Day, which for those of you that are not familiar, is a day where we invite area high schools to come out and actually physically tour several different manufacturers here within um, the city of Beatrice. Participating manufacturers have been Neapco, um, Precise Fabrication, Rare Earth, Landmark. Um, they, so we had five, five schools attend this year for a total of approximately 143 students. We have started doing it in the spring as well as the fall. This year, we are going to shift our spring event. Um, so if you go to the back of the packet that I provided you, this is the Greater Nebraska Youth Survey that was completed by the Nebraska Community Foundation in partnership with the University of Nebraska Omaha. And what they did is they surveyed um, thousands of students throughout rural communities in Nebraska, kind of gauging 
various things um, and their plans for their future, those types of things. And, and a lot of the questions that it asks the students is, what do you want to, what do you want to do when you grow up? Which Engage hosted a presentation on Friday that talked about how to engage kids in career development to prepare them for the workforce. What this survey tells me is that students are really only aware of positions really in agriculture and healthcare. They're not really aware of anything else. So one thing that I think Engage can do to help with workforce shortages and that talent pipeline is to help highlight those businesses that kids really aren't aware of. So changing and tweaking that spring manufacturing day to a business and industry day, and we've already had businesses reaching out to us saying we want to do the same thing. Can we partner with you and do that? So that's kind of a, becoming a growing event and a way to educate and train our, our next generation of workforce. Um, aside from that, again, um, briefly touched on Engage hosting Mark Perna, who's a generational expert in, in the workforce training sector. Um, we had a fantastic showing of nearly 100 people that attended um, and several dignitaries in attendance, as well as Senator Fisher's office and Senator Ricketts' office were in, in attendance that day as well. As if that's not enough to do, we've been actively working on um, bringing the projects that we've brought before you to the finish line and kind of tidying up all of the last things needed to do on those. And again, continually um, engaging with area businesses, um, both in Beatrice and out in the county, to make sure that we're constantly learning what their needs are, assessing those needs, and helping them stay successful. Um, of course, we're always actively working on new recruitment projects. I had another one come in on Friday, so we're, we're working to secure additional projects coming in in the future. But with that, um, I would take any questions. Any questions? I maybe have more of a comment than a question. When, sure. when I really read this, um, what stood out to me, Rachel, was um, that when they listed one to seven, what was most important and what, what was least, mo uh, least important to the people that were in the survey, mostly middle school and high school kids, that the number one thing here was safety from violence and theft. Mm -hmm. Interesting fact, Yeah, isn't 10, it? 15, 20 years ago, I don't think that would have been first. You know, but on the other side, it looks like um, most of them wanted, want small communities. They like living in Nebraska. They like, we just got to give them jobs. Yeah, and a lot of them could see themselves living back in the community that yep. they grew up in, which yep. is great. That just so. surprised me when I read mm -hmm. that. Any other? I'm looking at page five. What do you attribute to the, when it's a, by participants by race and ethnicity, 86% uh, were white. Uh, black or African American, 1%, Latino, Hispanic or Spanish, orange, and 10%. And at the bottom it says, do you have a job, including summer jobs, babysitting, mowing lawns? You see the disparity mm -hmm. in that? Mm -hmm. What's that tell us? That, to me, says that 86% of survey respondents have some sort of summer job. Wow. Yeah, it's great. Rachel, as always, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank Good you. luck. Thanks, Rachel. Thank you. Okay. That brings things to uh, executive session tonight. Uh, we are going to go to the executive session. And no decisions will be made. Mr. McLean. I move the city, Beatrice City Council, go into closed session at 7.48 p.m. for the protection of public interest to discuss personnel. Second. No, I just. Oh, I'm trying to stay awake. Six. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Mm -hmm. All right.